Jesus. We got Sunday school, guys. Praise the Lord, yeah. Sunday school. It's good. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. You may be seated. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you for your <coughs> worship and uh, praise and prayer requests. And God bless all of you for being here this morning. It's great to be back and to see everyone again, or at least everyone that's here. And uh, say uh, welcome to everyone on Facebook or joining us uh, via the internet, wherever you might be. And uh, we appreciate you being a part of this service as always. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Seeing a lot of weird things and going on and... Uh, we're all, uh, most all of us are going through some things and have battled some issues, but uh, God is greater than all of that. Amen. And uh, there is a tremendous victory for all of us. I'm talking to people out there on the Internet in Pakistan, in Georgia, in uh, Arizona, all across this nation that, w that are with us on Facebook, that there's a victory to come. There's never a battle without a victory, amen? And God is always victorious, and he's our God, and therefore we are going to enjoy victory, praise the Lord, amen. and it's going to be tremendous. I can't, I can't tell you what it is. I can only tell you that it's going to be something beyond our wildest imagination to deal with what we've been dealing with just as a local church, and those of you that are part of this church, uh, believe me, the enemy is scared to death or he wouldn't be fighting the way he is. He wouldn't be throwing every obstacle that he can and all that he's doing against us. So uh, he knows in the spirit that something dramatic is about to take place, and it's all about the Lord. Hallelujah. So praise God. Again, I want to thank all of you for being with us this morning and uh, for sharing. I want to especially thank Suzanne and Mike for all that they've been doing all along, but especially over the last month they've been doing double, triple, and quadruple duty, amen, and uh, the, she's, I know uh, Suzanne's just done a, a great job in everything that she has done, and I, I want to say this, Mike is uh, less obvious, less uh, visible, let's say, but just as involved, and I guarantee you he's been doing so much that uh, is unseen, but without him, None of the rest of us would be taking place either, so I'm, I'm really grateful to both of them. And also, I want to thank Tim and Leah. Uh, Tim uh, stood in for me the first Sunday back uh, in October. Uh, I believe it was October. No, it was November. I don't even know what year. This is still 21. But, uh, but yeah, the 7th, the 7th of November was the first Sunday that we were, we were sick early in that week. And then uh, Suzanne was going to take it, and then she was ill. So Tim graciously stood up and <laughs> praise the Lord, we haven't seen him since. So no, nah, I'm just saying, but thank God for him and, and uh, his ministry as well as he's always been a blessing. And, and we're looking forward to having him back and, and Leah as well. So, but anyway, God bless all of you. And uh, thank you for your prayers and uh, all that God's doing. He's doing for all of us, praise the Lord. So thank God for that, amen. Praise the Lord. So I'm just going to meander around here a little bit this morning. Uh, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And Suzanne was, uh, she, she spoke to the Holy Spirit and me and the way the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me over the last month. <clears throat> and I'm fine, but my voice kind of comes and goes a little bit, so uh, bear with me. But... We're born from above. Amen. We are literally spirit beings. Now, we, we have a body, and we're, we have to have one to be in this world, but that's not our true identity. Who we are are spirits. Who we are are children of God, who is a spirit. Amen? And just like Jesus, we are filled with the fullness of the Godhead. We have him in us bodily, praise the Lord. And so uh, nothing's impossible for us if we can keep our identity intact. So when we were going through this uh, COVID thing, especially if it was like two weeks that were really the worst, and uh, 
I don't know, I think we were sleeping about 18 hours out of the day. We'd get up and I'd uh, try to keep my regular routine. I'd change the litter box for the cat and feed the cat and put the water out and go out and feed the birds. And it was exhausting. I mean, I'd, by the time I'd get upstairs to take care of the cat, I'd have to sit down. I mean, I've never felt like this before in my life. And I'm not trying to make this about me. I'm just saying where we were, you know, mentally and physically as well as emotionally. And so it, I, because I've never had to go through something like this, it was just so disorienting and so uh, weird and uh, exhausting. Get up and I'd sleep upstairs sometimes in the chair. I had a match, uh, you know, we've got blow up mattresses for the grandkids and stuff. And I had one of those up there for a couple of days because we didn't know for sure what was going on. We just knew that it was getting, it was just getting strange. I was actually hallucinating. I was, you know, you'd have conversations in your own head and not be able to orient between when I finally went to the doctor, Sally had to go and, and she was uh, put in the hospital for about eight hours to get her oxygen levels and everything back up. Thank God it, it, it happened quickly. Uh, but then she was freaked out the next day because I was breathing weird and I wasn't going to go. I thought, you know, hey, let's get, we'll get past this, praise the Lord. But uh, between her and Tammy, <laughs> I ended up going. And I was pretending. I mean, this was literally, I was like acting me. It's like I was observing all this, but it wasn't really me. You know what I'm saying? It's like schizophrenic is what I'm saying. It was just the weirdest sensation. Anyway, I went through it and I got back home and of course we tested positive and all that stuff. Well, when I would sleep, and Sally and I had a couple of conversations about dreams, and in fact, well, I won't, I won't go into that, but anyway, um, I dreamed I was in prison, but it wasn't like a normal prison. It was one prison I was in, uh, and I can't tell you if this was over a two or three day period, or if it was just within one day when I'd wake up and go back to sleep or whatever, but I was in this, it was just pitch black, you couldn't see anything. I just knew I was confined and it was in a, seemed like a really small space and I'm a little bit claustrophobic so that was really added to the, uh, you know, kind of the tension. And uh, I couldn't see light anywhere, I couldn't see a door, I couldn't see a lock, I couldn't see it, just, just totally uh, imprisoned. And, uh, and it was the weirdest, the scariest, I gotta say, uh, sensation I've ever had. It was just bizarre. So then the next dream I had about being in prison, which was shortly after that, it was in a, a wide, it was an open space, and it was light, it was really light. I couldn't really see beyond uh, a, any great distance, but I could tell that it was open, it was an open space, but yet I felt totally in prison, like I knew I couldn't get out of this, I couldn't get past it. And so it was really stressful and weird and freaky. And this went on for several days. I mean, every time I'd go to sleep, I'd have this same dream. And, uh, and I'm, all the time, I'm praying, but it's almost like not, it's not me praying. You know, I'm listening, I'm hearing myself talking to God, but I'm like an observer almost. It was the way your mind just gets so confused. And I was talking to the Lord, and I said, Come on, I'm healed. In Jesus' name, I know I'm healed by your stripes. I was healed, and yet... Every day it was worse, every day, you know what I mean? And as the day would progress, it would, it would seem worse and worse. And the more I would be proclaiming, the worse I felt. And so it was like this battle in my own mind to just not give in to confess what I was really experiencing. And what I was experiencing was overwhelming. I'm just saying, uh, not to make it about me, but just so you can understand the tension from where this was coming from. And the, the Lord finally, after several days, when I started to think a little more clearly, and I was talking to the Lord and I said, this isn't right, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm upset with you because, you know, I should be healed by now. I, should be, I shouldn't be going through all of this, you know. And I was just having this conversation and the Lord reminded me of the different times people were in prison in the, in the Bible. And one time an angel came and delivered them. And I said, well, yeah. The angel came and delivered. I ain't seen an angel, you know. And then the other time, an earthquake shook the place. And he said, what about Paul? I mean, the Lord, I, it was almost like it was out loud. And I said, what about it? Look. So I go to the scripture and I find where Paul's in jail for two years. No deliverance, no nothing. He's just there and doesn't have any idea. Ultimately, he ends up getting his head chopped off or 
you know, murdered for his faith. So that didn't, you know, make me feel real good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I knew it was the Lord talking to me, you know. And then, so there's just all of these battles going on. And the, the truth is, the physical battle was the least of it. It was really the emotional and the mental thing that was overwhelming. And so, the, what the Lord was saying was, you are captive to a spirit. You're being held captive. And whether you escape or not is not the issue. It's how you're going to maintain yourself in captivity. Yes. How you're going to survive yes. if you don't get set free. Right. How, how are you? And, and, you know, I was saying, well, you know, I, I should be healed by now. Because I'm never sick. I just, honest to God, I just hardly ever get sick. And when I have been sick, it's only for a couple of days. I really don't have to pray. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I haven't really had to. You know, say, come on, I'm delivered. You know, I'm always confessing what the word says, but I've never really had to get into that place where I was in the battle for it, you know. And so I'm struggling with this thing, and, and uh, the Lord reminded me of the lepers. He said, you know, there were lepers that were healed instantaneously, but there were lepers who were healed as they went. Right. So if you didn't get healed instantly, you better be as you went. You better be wenting. You know, you better be going. You better be doing something, amen, in order to have this experience, to have it take place. Now, and this has got nothing to do with Peter, but I just want to say this to, to, so that there isn't any confusion. Some things we're just not going to know in this world. That's all there is to it. So what, whatever, Peter had something to do with where he is. And I don't mean that in a negative way. Because believe me, if any of us were there, you'd be hard pressed to get us to come back. We only think of things on this level where we have family and friends and loved ones and so forth and, and we are left behind and so we grieve and, and we're concerned about that. But believe me, he's not. He's where all of our spirits are dying. <laughs> Literally, we'll have to die to get there. Our physical bodies will. And it's like Smith Wigglesworth's wife. You know, he raised her from the dead and she was really upset with him. She told him, she said, why did you bring me back? I mean, she was not happy about being resurrected. She was totally happy where she was. Amen. So I'm sure Peter's in the same situation. And not that he didn't care for, to, to want to leave his family and everything. But come on. He's in heaven. He's with Jesus. He's where we came from. He's home. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. So anyway, I'm saying this was a battle. And it was a battle with my mind. I'm healed. I'm delivered. And yet, nothing agreed with that confession and with the word of God, even, in the natural, right? So let me, let's go, let's start here. And I'm going to be everywhere. And I've got, this is going to be weird, I know, for you guys. But trust me, I think it'll make some sense at some point. But I've been, and you know what, years ago, I did drugs just about everyone imaginable. I had some experiences this time, unlike any drug I've ever had. I mean, in my mind, it was so strange. It was so oppressive and so, uh, I don't know, whatever it was coming against me was so aggressive, unlike anything I've ever experienced. So anyhow, praise the Lord. Isaiah, uh, excuse me, uh, Psalms 55 and verse 18, and the Lord took me to the scripture. I've got a a uh, Messianic Jewish Bible Tree of Life Bible. And uh, I would use it except that the scriptures are off a little bit. Sometimes they don't use the same uh, numeric. Uh, in other words, you might be reading 18 in the King James, verse 18, and it's verse 19 or vice versa. You know, there's sometimes, it's just like a regular Jewish Bible, so they're not always in sequence. <clears throat> Even though the scriptures are the same, they're just not numbered the same. But here he says, he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. And here's the literal translation that says, He has redeemed my soul in shalom from the battle because there were many striving with me. 
And when, when I read that, immediately I felt the witness of the Holy Spirit. And I said, thank you, Jesus. Okay, so you do know what's going on here. You know, it's not like you're oblivious to what I'm struggling with. Amen. And so it's the battle of the spirit and the flesh. The battle of the visible and the invisible. The battle of our true identity and the flesh that we dwell in. That that true identity lives in. The word of God and our sense realm. Amen. So that's what it was all about. And I thought about Peter because I got a phone call. Sally got up that morning when Peter passed away. And she said, I'm going to call because I had been texting back and forth with Peter just a couple of days or three or four days earlier about doing some things with PayPal to get some things set up for, and he was going to help me do it all. And I said, okay, Pete, I appreciate it, but right now I've got to focus on healing because I can't really concentrate. I can't get, and he said, that's cool. I understand. So like three or four days later, I get a text from him saying, I have never been this sick before in my life. Well, he sent the same text to Suzanne. We both got the same text. And, of course, we both prayed. And I, I, she had talked, spoke life to him. And, and I was praying. I said, Peter, it's one day at a time. It's faith one day at a time. That's how this has to work, you know. And so, you know, wherever we're all struggling and so forth. Well, a couple of days or maybe four or five days later, I can't remember because everything kind of got screwed up numerically in my head. But we got up and Sally said, I'm going to. Have you heard back from Peter? And I said, no, not since we prayed. And uh, she said, well, I'm going to get on uh, Facebook and see how he's doing. Just out of the clear blue, right? So she's on Facebook trying to find, you know, information, see if he's been on there, see if anybody's talking back and forth. Message, Message whatever. And uh, so I go upstairs because my phone was on the charger, and I went up to check my phone, and I got a, uh, a voicemail from a number that I didn't recognize. So I went ahead and rang the voicemail up, and it's Peter's sister saying he had passed away. And the funeral home had just come and taken the body. So I'm, you know, I'm, first of all, I'm already having trouble trying to make sense out of stuff. And at that time, I couldn't hardly talk at all. My voice I had was so bizarre, you couldn't understand it probably anyway. And I came downstairs, and I said, Sally, Peter's died. And she, of course, was as dumbfounded as I was, you know. But God was preparing us, you know. I mean, he was trying to let us know. So I'm just saying this was a bat. This was just so insane, the whole, all this stuff that was going on. And I'm thinking, why, how? I mean, come on. And the Lord reminded me. He said Jesus was told of his cousin, whom he was close to. He was in prison. Jesus didn't get him out of prison. He was beheaded. Jesus didn't save his life. And after he was beheaded, he didn't resurrect him. And I'm thinking, Lord, there's a lot of things we don't understand. Maybe we don't have to understand. And this is about just simply about having faith in God. There's some things we're just not going to be able to explain in this life. My daughter, Allison, said, I, if I live 900 years, I don't think I'll figure some of this stuff out. And I said, honey, no matter how long we live, there's going to be some stuff in this world we're never going to figure. We just got to trust God. We just got to believe that he is good and that whatever's happening, he's got an ultimate purpose in all of it. Amen. There's no negatives here, right? So he redeemed my soul or my thinking, my mind, right? in peace from the multitude of, of spirits and issues and things that were against me. Amen? So I'm saying I'm healed, but I'm not healed. I'm saying Peter's alive, but he's not. I'm declaring that I'm set free from these, this prison thing, and yet I'm still bound. So the Lord took me to Romans chapter 7. Let's go there. At, this is after the Psalms 55, that he has redeemed my soul, my mind, right? From, from in peace, he has redeemed it into peace from this battle that's taken place all around me. 
It's Romans 7, beginning at verse 15, and we'll read all the way to chapter 8, verse 1. Romans 7, verse 15, for that which I do. Now, this is Paul, who was in prison, who was shipwrecked and stoned to death and beaten and, you know, come on, on and on and on and on. I'm sure if he were overhearing my conversation with the Lord, he would have said, just tell him to shut up and grow up. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> but for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do, or that's what I'm doing. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it's good. Now then, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, let's get this. First of all, listen, we're not talking about sinful behavior. We're talking about either being in, in the flesh or in the spirit. We're either in sync with the word of God or we're battling with our own flesh. That's what Paul's really talking about here. Right? I'm saying I'm healed, but I'm not experienced healing. Right? I'm, I'm saying these things. I'm, I'm saying what the Word says, but I'm not experiencing what the Word says. So it can't be, it can't be me, who I really am. It can't really be my spirit. It's got to be my flesh that's dominating here somehow, even though I don't understand why. Right? So I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me. Whenever you're trying to do or be who you really are in Christ, the you... The flesh you is going to fight that. It's going to battle you. Amen. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. So there's, a, there's this, this battle, this soul battle, amen, that's taking place, spiritual battle in the soul, your mind. And it's bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. This is what I was going through. This is the battle that I was going through, but I'm not, I'm not just saying about me, I think everybody goes through it. it, just happened to be this was the most dominant experience I'd ever had in it, right? Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? This was what I was praying, this was what I was saying to God. Come on, how do I, what, do I, what am I supposed to do that I'm not doing? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. I had to get to the place where I've got to, to where this is true. If I die, this is still true. Yes. If I never get out of prison, this is still true. If I never have a wake up one day and everything is okay again, this is still true. Yes. Amen. I thank God through Jesus Christ. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, our identity. Amen. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, he's not talking about a, a walk down the sidewalk. He's talking about who live their life. Good, bad, positive, negative who live their life based on the Spirit, regardless of what the flesh is saying. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. So let's go now here. It'll only get weird from here. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40. Exodus 25 verse 40. And I've got several scriptures here getting into this, Mike, so bear with me. But beginning at Exodus 25 verse 40. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mountain. Now, this is God talking to Moses when he built the tabernacle. Make sure you build it exactly as I'm describing it to you, as you see it in the spirit, in the heavenly. Right? Look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mountain. All right? Verse 31, or excuse me, chapter 31, verse 2 through 5. Still in Exodus here. Exodus 31, 2 through 5. 
See, I called by name Bezali, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works to work in gold and silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. We'll get back to him in just a minute. But let's go back to Hebrews now, chapter 8 and verse 5. See, I have called by name. Now, I want to go to Hebrews 8 and verse 5. It's all right. That's all right. That's all right. All I can do is say it. I can't do any of that. That's why I'm saying it. You're doing it. Praise the Lord. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. All right. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 27. Ezekiel 36 verse 27. I've had a lot of time on my hands, so you know you got to deal with it. Praise the Lord. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Hebrews 13, verse 21. You're seeing the connection here between the tabernacle and us. Hebrews 13, verse 21. Make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So when God gave the instructions for building the tabernacle, everything had to be made exactly according to the pattern. Exact measurements, exact specifications. Everything was precise. Amen. And all of that came about through a man named Bezalel. And that name... It has, it's actually two names. Tzel, which means shade or shadow, an opaque object, and El, which is the strength of God. So he said, here's a guy, and I'm going to give him this name because of what he's going to do. It's going to be a shadow. It's going to be opaque. It's going to be hard to understand, but it's going to be done by the strength of God. It's going to be done by the Holy Spirit, in other words. Amen. So through Bezalel, the Spirit of God built the tabernacle. He was just the thing he used, right? He was just the shadow of the real deal. Amen? And so what's that reveal? The Spirit fulfills the plans of God. And building the tabernacle was part of the law of Moses, if you remember. And the day... That, they, that he got the program for building this thing was when the law was given on the Feast of Shavuot. And that day we call Pentecost. And that's the same day that God gave his spirit to the followers of Jesus. The same spirit that translated all the plans, all of the blueprints, all of the measurements, all of the specificities of the tabernacle into reality. That spirit. That same spirit was given to you. That same spirit was given to me. That same spirit was given to us. Why? Yes. To do the same work. To translate 
the purposes of God into reality. He said, I've already put this in you. I, I know who you are. I know what you are. I have created you to do perfect works. I've created you to do good works. Ezekiel 36, 27. It's okay. Ezekiel 36, verse 27. Guarantee you the devil don't like this. Praise God. Now I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now here's what's interesting. Behind the word statutes there is a Hebrew word that refers to appointed times and measures. Praise the Lord. See, God's purposes... God's will and his plans for your life are just as detailed, they're just as specific, they're just as precise as those of the tabernacle. Because you are the tabernacle of God, you are the temple of the living God. His plans are perfect even if they seem like shadows, even if they seem dreamlike. They're still perfect. And that's why he gives us his spirit. The spirit gives us power to fulfill God's plan. To move in his perfect will. Even in our imperfection that Paul was talking about. To walk in the exact footsteps down to the exact measurements and specifications of his appointed purposes for each of our lives. This is what God was telling me. Nathan, I'm not done with you. I've got a purpose for you. Whether you understand it, maybe it's just a shadow to you. You, you can't comprehend it all. It's like a dream somehow. But I have put this in you and have given you my spirit that you're going to do this thing just the way I intended it to be done, whether it looks like it or not. Your understanding is still being controlled much, much by natural things rather than by the Spirit. He told us we're going to walk in the exact footsteps down to the exact measurements and specifications of his appointed purposes for each of our lives. It's why we have to live by the Spirit, church. It's why we cannot let the flesh dominate us. This is by faith. It's not by intellect. Live by the Spirit. Move in His leading. And when we do that, we are in appointed times. We are in appointed footsteps. Praise the Lord. Now, don't misunderstand me when I say this. I'm not a big one for having people pray for me. I appreciate the prayers of the church, don't get me wrong. But individuals, because somebody says, I have a healing ministry, I'm, I, I'm not for that. And I don't think God is. And I'm not criticizing people, I'm just saying, yes, we all, see, that's our identity. And when we give that away to some person or persons, we're robbing ourselves of who we are. It's, I mean, God taught me these things without me even understanding some of what he was teaching me when I was running to this re revival, this revival, this big name ministry and that thing. And you know I was doing this. I was all over the United States doing it. And God told me, Nathan, what has he got that you don't have? Well, I don't, well a big ministry and he's seeing people healed. You, he's, he's only doing what you are capable of doing but not doing. Because you'd rather go there and have him pray for you than you believe God and do it yourself. Praise the Lord. See, we're robbing ourselves of our identity when we go to somebody else and trust in their identity to be my answer. 
I'm not against, I know, I, I believe they're doing it for good purposes and good reasons, good motives. I'm just saying it's still not right. It's not good for you to be, be depending on somebody else's prayer for your healing. Because when you get into the place I was at, you ain't getting them to come and pray for you. And you couldn't tell them what it was you needed them to pray for anyhow. They're going to just have to wing it. Believe that they understand what it is you're needing. And I'm telling you, unless you were there, you don't know what was going on in my mind. Because I wasn't even sure. And I, I, I'm imagining that this is true for everybody to some degree all of the time, not just when you have a sickness. It's our flesh. Yes. We've got to be walking in the Spirit. We've got to operate by the Spirit no matter how odd, how unnatural, how unreal it may seem. Now, I'm going to get further into this because I've been there. Amen? Footsteps, our footsteps, you know, the footsteps that God has programmed for us are as real and as exact as the instructions for the tabernacle. They're that precise. There's a heavenly pattern for each of our lives. And it's in our identity in Christ. By the Spirit. And we cannot live out that identity without shedding the natural. And that's the battle. And it's an ever ongoing battle as long as we are in the flesh. Look at Psalms 126. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's only like six or eight verses, whatever. Psalms 126. This is David. I don't know how many exactly it is. It's five or six of them. Yeah. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. He's talking about the spirit and the flesh. The soul or the sense realm and the faith in the spirit realm. When we turned back, it was like we were in a dream. We were rejoicing. We were still in captivity, but we, we, were, still re we were rejoicing. It was like a dream world because God had said he would, he would set us free. And so we're... We're, we're going forth weeping, sowing our seed, knowing that ultimately we're going to come again rejoicing, bringing our harvest with us. But he said when, when this happened to us, it was like we were in a dream. We were rejoicing. It was negative, but it was like we were in a dream. We were, we were happy. We were celebrating. Amen. I'm telling you, God was talking to me. Am I who God says? Am I who I'm declaring? Sometimes it's like living an impossible contradiction. This is what Paul was talking about. It's what David's actually talking about. And we attempt to straddle dichotomies, you know, like... The failure and the victory. I'm sick, but by his stripes I'm healed. It's left and right. Like we're, we're, we're trying to stand in both places at the same time and make sense of it. That's where I was at, church. I'm trying to explain this in, a, in the only way I can. Amen. Think about Joseph, the dreamer. 
The truth is, we are living a dream from a natural perspective. Joseph's life, you know, is about constantly dealing with dreams and reality. First dream he has, he gets so excited because he knows it's real. He knows this is more real than, than what I'm living. And he goes and tells his brothers, probably not a good idea. Amen? It gets him into all kinds of trouble. And then later, he turns into a master interpreter of dreams. Amen? He, it gets him out of jail. It gets him all the way to second in command to Pharaoh, to the place that that first dream talked about. Yeah. Dreams were prominent in his life. Why? I'm going to try to answer some of that as we go along here. David said, before we returned to Zion, before we were back in our prophetic place where God had declared us to be, where we would be. He said we were like dreamers. Listen to what I'm saying to you. God has said we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are Christ in this world. We are the spirit of God in this realm. Amen? But it's like we're dreaming. It's like we're in a dream. In current times, what he was saying is literally, in the current times of our lives, the lives that in fact are like dreams. Because there is this dichotomy, this, this standing in healing and standing in sickness, declaring deliverance, and being captive. Am I making any kind of sense? So what's it mean? I mean, think about dreams. In dreams, the impossible happens. In, in real life, though, there's rules. There's regulations. There's laws. And we're pretty much stuck with them. Right? I'm not talking about fantasizing of being Superman and able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. I'm talking real life contradictions that in the back of our minds we wish could be true. But our rational mind throws cold water in our face and says, nope, it's impossible. It doesn't make sense. Forget it. This is the battle. I was going through, and it's a battle that we all go through, whether we want to admit it, at different times in our lives. It was just more prevalent, more predominant in my sick time. Amen? I lay hands on the sick. I cast out demons. I can do all things through Christ. I speak to things that are not as though they were. And yet, I'm seeing things not done. If life were a dream, the clashing realities and the competing narratives could both be true. Right? It would make perfect sense in a dream. After all, in dreams, cars fly. Yeah? I mean, in dreams, elephants are purple. In dreams, your great-grandmother still talks to you. If that can happen, then certainly some dichotomy in life is possible too. You could lay hands on the sick and see him recover. And not. Are you, are you with me? Are you understand what I'm, what I'm trying to get here? You could have faith that moves mountains. And ye, oh ye of little faith. You have the mind of Christ. 
but your rational mind crashes the party. Wagging that logical finger telling you, stop the nonsense, you're fooling, you're just talking. And here's where Joseph's dreams and King David's observation that we are like dreamers become the very stuff of life of what it is really made of. Guess what? In this crazy, inverse world that we live in, we're not of this world. We're, we're from another place. We're from a spirit realm. But in this crazy inverse world that we live in, life is a dream. So we may as well relish it. <laughs> I know I'm, I'm just way gone, but look, the truth is, this is the fa fallacy. This is the temporary. This is the fading. This is the passing. This is the unreal. You see, what, that's what God is saying. We are not of this world. We are in this world, and it's like a dream. Because there's this dichotomy. There's this, I'm healed, and I'm not healed. I have the mind of Christ, and I'm crazier than a loon. Amen? It's a way of trying to understand David. We were like dreamers. He's trying to explain what I was dealing with, what all of us deal with to some degree in some way or another at different times in our lives. Psalms 126, if you can again, Mike. Psalms 126, the, I think, six verses. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There's an old Jewish belief. The sages used to teach this. Since the fall, when Adam gave his uh, dominion to Satan by disobedience, by not believing what God said. Since that time, the world we inhabit is called the world of lines. Before the fall, the world was called the world of circles. God is a circle. There's no beginning and no end. He operates in a circle. Seed time, right? Planting, harvest. In the linear world, things have to align perfectly and they have to make sense. That's the world that we were born from above and put into. Amen? Laws have to be adhered to. There's gravity, there's laws of all different kinds, but they have to be followed. If you stretch one line into the distance, it will never bump into another line running on a different track from the same starting point, right? Timelines don't intersect. I've taught on this before years back. They don't intersect. A timeline is just a timeline and you can't make it intersect or interact with another. It just, where it starts from, that's it's going to go into eternity. Amen? If you stretch one line into the distance, it'll never bump into the other. It'll never hit another life running on a different track from the same starting point. That kind of world flows, and I understand this, from a godly energy that is contained, that is systematic and disciplined to the contours of creation. So you can look and see God in creation. 
but it's still confined. Right? It's, it, when you look at it that way, you're looking at God contained. Right? You're looking at him in a system. You're looking at him in a discipline to the contours of that creation, within the creation, in other words, confined to it. It's the world of hierarchies, of systems, you know, of rules. An elephant is gray. Amen? Your great-grandmother doesn't talk to you anymore. And cars don't fly. God's still in it, but there are rules that God demands that those people of that world have to live by. But in a circular world, where we come from, no alignment, no order, no rules. It's called the spirit realm. There's no beginning, there's no end. There's no beginning or an end to a circle. And all of the items inside jostle around without placement, amen, without regiment. After all, it's a circle, and anything can swirl around in the circle. From a natural perspective, it's a disjointed and chaotic world, the world of dreams, from the natural. That's why we struggle with it so much, the spirit realm I'm talking about, from the natural perspective. A world that's a byproduct of a godly energy that is free of constraint. <laughs> Have all the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in us bodily. If that isn't a dream, and reality, I don't know what else you could call it. It's an energy that is free of constraint, untied to the rules and the regulations of a linear reality. In it, but not controlled by it. Born again. And so in a surprising twist, we're told that the world we live in comes from that circular, dreamy world. And of course, every average day is, from the natural, it seems to be ramrod straight. Right? But the true source of the energy of that life, from which we feed, is that supernatural. The circular. Amen? Amen? We walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 8.1. The answer to Paul's contradiction. I'm in this mess. I know I'm not this, but that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm experiencing. And so God tells him, you're trying to live your circular life in a linear way. It won't work. You've got to come to Jesus. You've got to have a come to Jesus moment. You've got to come to an identity in Christ moment. And when that happens, there's now therefore no condemnation. There's nobody saying, no, you're not the righteousness of God. There's nobody saying, no, you don't heal the sick. There's nobody saying, no, you, you, you can't raise the dead. Right? Because it's you that's saying it. It's, it's, that's, the, that's the contradiction. That's the... That's the the juxtaposition, if you will, it's you fighting you. It's your linear you fighting the circular you. It's what Jesus came to show us that the spirit is greater than the flesh. But you've got to let the spirit dominate. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Church, that's what Suzanne's talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about. We have got to come to our identity and live from that identity or nothing is going to change. That's important because if you think you're living a lie, and that what you're doing today doesn't match up with what you dreamed it should be. 
you need to stop. You need to take a deep breath and remember that it's a crazy world that we're living in, literally, the world that we're living in. And in some wild way, it is a dream to us. It, it may be reality to the people who are not born again, who are not from the circular world. It's, it's real enough to them and it's all they know. But it's like a dream for us. Your life is full of contradictions. Welcome to my world. And from Joseph to David, you should know that if it doesn't make sense to you and it feels like a lie, it's okay. Just know that there is truth in it no matter what the enemy tries to tell you. So when it feels like it's fallen apart, when a Peter dies, when we're sick and we're confessing healing, when we're casting out demons and they keep barking back, when we're, we're, when we're walking by the Spirit and yet the flesh keeps trying to overwhelm us, when it feels like it's fallen apart, don't give up. Pick up the pieces and keep on growing in your faith. Telling yourself that this dreamlike state is actually a real thing. And that's okay as long as we don't fall asleep. Stay in the word. Stay in faith. And you may just bump into a purple elephant. Praise the Lord. When Joseph was in prison, you know the story. The Pharaoh's baker and their butler come to him. And they share their respective dreams. And then they ask Joseph for an interpretation. Now the butler, or the cupbearer, let's go there, uh, Mike, Genesis chapter 40, verse 9 through 11. And I'll show you what the Lord is showing me. Genesis 49 through 11. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes, and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. That's the butler, the cupbearer's dream. All right, look at the baker's dream, Genesis 40, verse 16 and 17. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, what the butler got, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And we know how the story ends, right? Joseph tells the butler he's gonna be restored to his position in three days. As for the baker, not so good news. In three days, your head will hang from the gallows. So here's the question. Why did Joseph interpret the dreams so dramatically different? I mean, they both feature identical elements, three items, with the player or the individual dreamer in the center of the action. What did Joseph spot in the dreams that indicated such drastically different interpretations? The answer is actually amazingly simple, and it jumps out at you when you look at the text closely. When you read the butler's narrative, he's an active player in the story. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, he says, and I took the grapes, and I squeezed them, and I put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. See, it's all about what he's doing. He's involved in the dream. Amen? In contrast, the baker is a passive observer. 
He's not doing anything. It's his story. It's his life. It's his dream. And he's just a a casual, passive observer. Mm -hmm. He describes a similar scene with three items. But instead of him doing anything about it, he observes how the birds were eating from the basket on top of his head. I mean, it's his bread. It's his basket. (laughs) Right? It's his stuff that those birds are eating. And yet he doesn't do anything about it. It's, It's not him feeding the birds. It's the birds doing what they want as he just idly watches them do it. Joseph jumped on it immediately, and he had his interpretation. Life is about activity. Life is about being involved. Life is about taking your role seriously. Taking the battle, the warfare, and not giving into it. The butler was an active player in his story, indicating life, purpose. The baker is a passive cog, inactive, synonymous with no purpose, with death. And the dreams just spoke for themselves. Church, we've got to stop looking at life as something that just happens to us. The butler saw his life, good or bad, as something that he that he does. A plot that he carries out. But not the baker. He's just a victim of circumstances. Look at the crap that always happens to me. Now I'll show you this. We're living a dream, whether you want to admit it or not. The dream is only exaggerated because of the natural. If it wasn't for the natural, the dream would seem perfectly right. Am I right? When you're dreaming, the dream seems totally right. And no matter how bizarre, you know people that don't look like them, but yet you know it's them. Right? You'll see Joe Blow, some guy you know and have known for years and years and years, but he looks like Aunt Faye. But you know it's Joe. Right? Because it's, a, it's something spiritual. It's not, you're not going by the natural senses, by your sense of sight or, or the, the normal sense realm. You're outside of that. Right? So Joseph's, Joseph's identity was in his coat of many colors. Remember, his father made it, and his father was prophesying, saying, you're going to be the head of this family. You're going to be the one who gets everything. You're going to be the one who inherits, right? And this coat identifies you as my favorite. Right? It was prophetic. It was God-given. And it was the first thing that his brothers took. His identity. His prophetic identity. Who God said he was through his own father. That was the first thing they took. Think about it. Who you are in Christ is a threat to the devil. God has spoken prophetically of you as his inheritor, as his child, as his favorite. Right? You think the devil is any different than Joseph's brothers? He's threatened by that prophetic identity that God has given you because it's your real identity. And the thing that he wants more than anything else is to steal that identity. If he can get your identity, he can rip you off for anything and everything. Think, when Pharaoh's wife tried to destroy Joseph, what did she do? She stole his his garment. Right? Because that was his identity. If it wasn't his identity, she wouldn't have kept it. She kept it because it identified it as being Joseph that she claimed had attacked her. She was doing the same thing. She was stealing his identity 
because she knew that's where the prophetic word of God was in his true identity. The enemy wants your God-given identity. He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care if you live or if you die, if you're sick or if you're healthy. He wants your identity. God is a circular God. Seed, plant, harvest. Why did God give Abram a new name? Because he had a prophetic identity for Abram. And it was Abraham, the father of many nations. Not a fatherless man. Not a man with no, inherit, with no uh, progenity. But a father that would be over many nations. So he gave him a different name, a different identity. God gave us a new name. Yeshua. Jesus. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus, right? You are born of God. Healing, deliverance, salvation, prosperity, victory is your identity. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Who you are in Christ is your purpose. It's your identity. David becomes king. His identity has changed from a shepherd to a king. It was like a dream. He so said it's like we were dreaming. Joseph comes from being dug out of a well and out of a prison to being at the right hand of Pharaoh. Our identity is what the enemy wants to steal. We've been given a shadow plan, uh, a dreamlike but yet real purpose and identity for life. Don't be afraid. Just because of the seeming contradictions. Trust in the El God of the shadow. The strength of the one who gave the dream. Live the dream. And that dream is abide in his abiding. Rest in his resting. Remain in his remaining. Dwell in his dwelling. Inhabit his habitation. And to do that, we have to live the dream. With all of the contradictions that go with it. Be the physical reality of that heavenly vision. Be that tabernacle that was designed specifically for the, for the dwelling place of God. For God to move from, to work from, to work through. I hope I haven't given you a headache. Praise the Lord. I, we have an identity. And that's what the enemy wants. And he'll use anything and everything he can. And we look at this thing as, as you know, we're just screwed up. No, we are the dream. But we're caught in a false reality. And there are contradictions constantly. That's why we have to always go to the dream as our reality and not the natural world. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We were like dreamers. Amen. We went forth sowing with tears. But man, we come back with joy, reaping, bringing our sheaves with us, the victory, the healings, the deliverance, right? That's where we're headed for, church. We may be in the season of sowing and weeping right now, but I'm telling you, before we leave this planet, we're going to walk this dream out. We're going to be receiving the harvest. We're going to be walking, bringing those sheaves with us, and we're going to be shouting with joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Can you give him a hand this morning? Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you. Let's go with the power of dreams.
Let's live our dream. Let's be the dream. Amen? In Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Remember, no service Wednesday night. We'll come back Friday for a house of prayer and back here again on Sunday. God bless you all.